Welcome to the Reason and Theology Show, everyone. I'm your host, Michael Lofton, on a Saturday evening here, joined by William Albrecht, who's a co-host on the channel. Needs no introduction. And same thing for T-Fan, Turton Fan, who's a contributor here, also needs no introduction uh, for the vast majority of people. But hey, if you're new to the channel, I do have some bios uh there in the description for y'all if y'all want to check them out um but yeah gentlemen before we begin i first of all want to welcome y'all to the show william how are you doing wonderful great to be here with my uh my friend church and fan uh and great to be here with you michael yeah same here t fan how are you doing great great to be back on with you guys yeah it's been a while hasn't it <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah, I was saying we the other day. I was thinking, man, we really need to get T fan back on. It's been a while because I can't even think of the last time that uh, we've done a stump, stump the apologist and and you were um, on. So I was thinking, man, we got to do another one of these. So we'll be doing another one pretty soon. In fact, I uh, put it on the calendar where we're going to start doing a stump the apologist on the same day to a ask a Catholic on the same day and, and so on. Things will end up becoming more consistent. So everybody look forward to more uh, from T-Fan on the channel. Anyways, uh, gentlemen, again, welcome. And we're doing a debate here on the perpetual virginity. Uh, and by the way, I th have y'all debated this topic before? I know y'all have done a lot of debates. Probably about 13 or 14 years ago. <laughs> Is that oh, okay? So it's definitely due at this point. long, long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of stuff then, since then, and a lot of a lot of research. I'm sure on both of your. We've ends, been debating so. since it was dial-up internet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite that long. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Well, I'm I'm glad y'all are doing it here again. Uh, and um, yeah, so the the debate here is whether or not the Blessed Virgin Mary remained a virgin, um, you know, throughout the rest of her life. So, um, of course, William is going to be taking the affirmative to yeah. T fan. You're taking the negative. So, William, you're going to go first. I think as far as the format, what we have here is. Uh, let me pull it up. Uh, two 10-minute openings, two five-minute rebuttals, two 20-minute cross-examinations, two seven-minute closings, and then uh, Q&A questions, you know, all that at the end. So um, hold off on your questions until towards the end. When y'all see, um, yeah, it would be T-Fan giving the last closing. When y'all see him giving his closing, then go ahead and start putting your questions in there. And make sure to direct them specifically to, you know, at – to William or to T fan. That way I know, you know, who, who the question is for. All right. Well, if y'all are ready, um, let me get my timer here. We're doing <clears throat> starting here. Uh, William, you're going to do your 10 minutes and I am almost set here. Do you have your, uh, stopwatch there as well? I got it ready. Got it. All right. All right. Well, I am ready. If you are, okay, I will begin now. Holy Mary, lead, lead me and everybody uh, tuning into a deeper love of your incarnate Son. Does the Word of God, whether scriptural or traditional, ever give us any proof that the Mother of God, our Savior, Jesus the Christ, ever lost her virginity? The historical Christian position is that Mary is, i.e. Parthenos, ever virgin, and that is trumpeted through all of the early fathers, early councils, ancient papal statements, and all of the official statements of the faithful. The ancient faith of our day and age, whether Catholic or Orthodox, both, both proclaim that Mary is ever virgin. Indeed, even the Protestant reformers believed in the perpetual virginity of Mary. In our examination of the historical truth of this dogmatic teaching of the Christian faith, we will begin where we, very, where we first hear of the future virginal birth of our holy Theotokos. Indeed, we will find that nowhere on the face of Holy Writ is any indication given that Mary would ever lose her virginity nor is any indication given that Mary did lose her virginity. We will first examine the scriptural texts that indicate the virginal birth conception, and later on texts that are, uh, you know, kind of put forward and presented by modern day Protestantism uh, to, to uh, try to teach to the contrary. Uh, I always like to begin in Isaiah 7, uh, 10 to 14, where we read, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. The great Luke, St. Luke, recording in his gospel, the dialogue between the angel and Mary at the Annunciation, quotes the angel as follows. Behold, you shall conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and it will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne 
of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Obviously, direct reference is being made here to two Isaiah texts. This is noted by all major textual scholars, as well as noted by the great Dr. Uh, Manelli. We read where there's clearly, clearly something that's being taught here. So what we're shown in the beginning is uh, in the Old and New Testament, we get a glimpse of Mary giving birth and remaining a virgin. Indeed, the text shows us that Mary does not lose her virginity during the birth of Christ. We begin there, but is there any evidence that Mary lost her virginity after the birth of Christ? I want to remind the audience a very great resource, and I wish I had it here with me by my side, is Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma. If you want to find out what we what the faith teaches in regards to this, I'd recommend you go to the incredible volume, the tome from the great Ludwig Gott. In Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma, Ludwig Gott says, this is a defide teaching, that Mary bore her son without any violation of her virginal integrity. He further explains that there is also defide that after the birth of Jesus, Mary remained a virgin. It is once we arrive at the New Testament that we get a fuller picture of our Immaculate Mother as ever virgin. Indeed, many Catholics point to the scriptural passage where Mary's astonishment, uh, absolute utter uh, astonishment, we, we, we recognize that when, when, um, when the angel appears to Mary, uh, the kind of response is, is, one, of, uh, is one of astonishment. Um, how can this be, since I know not man, in Luke one thirty four, Mary definitely does seem quite perplexed at such an event being possible. And it is here where we like to do what the early fathers perhaps would have done, and that is point the audience to where on earth is the historian Luke? Where is this kind of perplexing language found? Can you ever find it in the Old Testament? And indeed you can. You can find it in the book of Judges 11, where we read of Jephthah's vow. We read in verse 29, then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. We read language that would be shockingly familiar to you. Language that if portions and bits of it were taken and said in the Greek, remember we're referring to Judges 11, the Septuagint version, if portions were taken directly from the Greek, one would be quite, quite confused perhaps whether one is talking about the Gospel of Luke or Judges 11. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord, we read. If you will give the Ammonites into my hand, whoever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return victorious from the Ammonites, shall be the Lord's, to be offered up by me as an offering, as a burnt offering. The language we find utilized here, we find so much parallelism, so much typological parallelism, that without a shadow of a doubt, we realize where this language of a vow is coming from. We frequently read in fathers like the great Ambrose, Augustine, and indeed many others, that Mary had taken a vow of virginity. But where do we find the kind of language that would indicate that Mary had indeed taken a vow? Indeed, Luke is hearkening to Judges 11. In verse 37, we read, she said to her father, let this be done for me. Let this thing be done for me. Notice the parallelism that we see here. Mary, Mary, uh, remain, remaining with Elizabeth for three months. Look at the language. How long the bewailing of her perpetual virginity was for Jephthah's daughter. At the end of two months, she returned to her father, who did with her according to the vow he had made. And, and now you run into language quite familiar. And she knew no man. And then we, on the flip side, we read Luke. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying in Luke 1, 29, and considered what manner of greeting this was. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He'll be great and be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. Verse 34, Mary's response to the angel, how can this be? since I do not know man. We can clearly identify where in Holy Writ, exactly where the words of Mary are coming from. Scholarly commentaries recognize it, and without a shadow of a doubt, the early fathers recognized. When Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know man? 
Verse 38. Also, there we have lining up with Judges 11. Let it be done to me. Let this thing be done to me according to your word. How can this be since I do not know man? The church fathers viewed these words as a vow. And in the third month, the vow was carried out. The text is clear. She knew no man. Examining the Tilgi in all of Greek literature prior to 100 AD, all of Greek literature, there are only two areas with this citation, all of Greek literature, Judges 11 and Luke 1. Luke is directly quoting this verse. He is telling us she knew not man. She remained a perpetual virgin. Breaking it down, one can look at it as how can this be that I'm going to have a child when I'm a perpetual virgin that has been vowed to God like Jephthah's daughter? Then the famous words from that Luke preserved. Luke was a historian. As the great Venerable Bede says, he interviewed Mary. Let it be done according to thy word. This is without a shadow of a doubt. Definitely the reason the fathers held to the, to the divine teaching that Mary had taken a vow of perpetual virginity. There's much more that can be said, much, much more parallelism, but indeed our time is running out. Indeed, we must look at other examples. What, in, in, Indeed, what other examples are there in Holy Writ that we find Mary remained a perpetual virgin? Well, we, we can also notice it when we look at the early fathers. And then let's take a look at in, in Matthew 1, much, much is, is made, much controversy is listed, and we're going to look at Matthew 1 in depth later. Hopefully, we'll get to examine that. But the one thing that kind of does seem to get forgotten in Matthew 1, and as my time runs, runs out to, uh, I've got about a minute and 10 seconds, Matthew does something quite, quite unique. It, he begins to list uh, women, and each woman named in Matthew's list has exactly the number, the limited number of children named as her own, and he begins to list them all. Matthew 1.3, he lists uh, children from a woman. Matthew 1.5, Matthew 1.5, Matthew 1.6, Matthew 1.16, and Matthew 1.18. What is the constant pattern that we find in Matthew 1? There is an emphasis here. There's an emphasis of women who have children. Their children are being listed. We have a categorical list being listed in Matthew 1. All through Matthew 1, there is a constant in the pattern. is that Matthew is emphasizing that Jesus was an only son by picking women in the Bible and listing completely their own children. When Mary is mentioned, the only adjustment that is made is to replace Jesus lacking paternity due to the virgin birth with the action of the Holy Spirit. But that is very clear. And the fathers are very clear in this as well. When time permits, I will go into them later. Thank you very much. That is it for my time. Spot on. All right. I'll reset the timer here. T fan, you ready? I'm ready. All right. You got 10 minutes for your opening beginning now. Thank you. I definitely think that what Mr. Albert has just said, which is that is there proof that Mary lost her virginity should be one side of the argument. The other side, of course, should be, is there proof that she didn't? Since, uh, as Mr. Albeck pointed out, it's not just required that people be open to the idea that Mary might have perpetually been a virgin, but it's demanded that uh, people believe this de fide. N notwithstanding that this is not found in the earliest layers of tradition, although it's a very old tradition. And although the tradition goes back outside of the church, even before the fourth century, where's the which is the first time that we see the fathers explicitly talking about it, setting aside some perhaps some uh, discussion by origin. But what about scripture? What does scripture say? Maybe we don't need to consider whether there's proof that she was perpetually a virgin. The scriptures don't say that. But what if the scriptures say something that tells us that she didn't remain a virgin. But before I get to that, let me briefly say, it is a matter of our faith that Mary was a virgin when Jesus was conceived. She's not born of men. Joseph is not Jesus' biological father. And that's something that scripture is exceedingly clear about. 
And her virginity in that sense is a matter of something that, of faith. And it's a, there is a reason why even in the creed, we see that uh, Jesus is described as being born of the Virgin Mary. Not because virginity has some kind of special status, but because of the fact that it was a miraculous birth and that he was not born of flesh and blood. But what about the scriptural evidence of her of Mary's non-virginity? Well, I would categorize this under five or six topics. The first two are both uh, associated with the same idea or the same passage, and those are knew her not until and firstborn son. And I bring these up first because I think these are the softest points. There is, first of all, Matthew one twenty five, which says that Joseph knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Luke 2, 7 says, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. The point of these two passages in emphasizing firstborn is, of course, that Mary did not have any children before Jesus. That's what's critical, and that's the reason that she he is described as the firstborn here. It's not that he was the firstborn of twins, or that Mary had another baby in her womb and Jesus came out first. We do see that in the case of twins, uh, with Jacob and Esau, for example. Uh, Esau is the firstborn because he came out first, even though they were twins in the womb. But it's also not necessarily in itself telling us that Jesus had brothers or sisters just because he's the firstborn son. He's the firstborn son, whether or not he has brothers or sisters. So this is a soft argument, uh, this point about firstborn son. The stronger one is, and knew her not till she had brought forth. The, the natural understanding of that phrase is that J Joseph abstained from doing his husbandly duties towards Mary until after Jesus' birth. And the natural understanding or the natural implication is that he did uh, know her after the birth. It's not explicitly stated. That's the softness of this argument. There, there is a natural understanding. It's the way that people speak. It's what's normally understood from that kind of expression in this kind of context, where the where the time is not the end of the world, like you know, or or some terminating event like death or or something like that. In the natural sense, is that he did know her afterwards. But of course, it's not. It falls short of being proof. But what about proof? Well, there is proof. We know there's proof because Jesus had brothers and sisters. The next point is brothers. Matthew 12, 46 tells us, while he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood without desiring to speak to him. Then Matthew 13, 55, we see his reputation in the community. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James and Joses and Simon and Judas? Mark 3, 31, then came his brethren and his mother and standing without sent unto him, calling him. Luke 8, 19, then came to him his mother and his brethren, and he could not come at him for the press. John 2, 12, after this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. John 7, 3, his brethren therefore said unto him, depart hence and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you do. John 7, 5, for neither did his brethren believe in him. John 7, 10, but when his brethren were gone up, then went also then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. And then Acts 1.14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. The reason I bring these many verses up, which all say the same thing, that Jesus had brothers, is for two reasons. Number one, these are not brothers in some spiritual sense, although the scriptures do sometimes use brothers in a spiritual sense. And in one place, when Jesus is told about his mother and his brethren, he, he points to his disciples and says, these are my mother and my brethren. And in a spiritual sense, we are Jesus' brethren. But this is not the sense in which the people who are speaking about Jesus, calling him the carpenter's son, calling his mother Mary, when they speak of his brethren, they mean his, bro his brothers, the, the, the other sons of his mother. And the same thing when we see... Uh, the we know this for sure that they're not his brothers simply by being believers because of John 7, 5, which says, neither did his brothers believe in him. Thankfully, in Acts 1, 14, we see that that changed, and it appears that his brothers did believe in him after his resurrection. 
But we're not stuck with brothers. Brothers sometimes can be used more broadly. We acknowledge sometimes that term in Greek can be used more broadly, but what we don't see used more broadly is the term sister. But guess what? Jesus had sisters too. Scripture tells us, Matthew 13, 56, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then has this man all these things? Again, Mark 6, 3, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joses and Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. So we see that it was well known at the time and it's recorded in all four Gospels that Jesus had brothers, and in two of the Gospels that Jesus had sisters. But that's not all. There's more. Mary was Joseph's wife, not just his girlfriend, not just his, his BFF. She was his wife. Matthew one twenty says, But while he thought on these things, meaning Joseph thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, you son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Now, what does it mean to take a wife to yourself? It doesn't, it doesn't mean just to buy her meals and put a roof over her head. Matthew 19.5 explains what's entailed, Matthew 19, 5 and 6, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. And again in Mark 10, 8, And they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain, but one flesh. So this scriptural principle which Jesus himself taught is that what a husband and wife do is become one flesh. And we know that Mary, that the angel of the Lord told Joseph in a dream not to be afraid to take Mary as his wife. And moreover, Paul taught us in 1 Corinthians 7, 5, defraud ye not one another, but one the other, except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So according to Paul, this coming together again, except for some temporary periods for prayer and fasting, that that's an essential part of a marriage relationship. And that's something that, that failing to do so is defrauding each other in the marriage. S serious words indeed. A final point I'd like to make is that Revelation 12, the woman in Revelation 12, is sometimes described as being Mary. I don't agree that it's literally referring to Mary. But for those who do take it that way, it's worth pointing out that if she is Mary, this is a denial of the, virgin, the maintenance of Mary's virginity in giving birth, because it says, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her, crown, or upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. This suggests that Mary's birth of Jesus, if this is referring to her Mary and to the literal birth of Jesus, was a natural birth, one that would have been associated with Jesus literally passing through her birth canal and therefore uh, parting her physically. All right, that's 10 minutes. Okay, so now we have two five-minute uh, rebuttals. William, uh, I got mine ready. Are you ready? I am ready. I will begin now. Thank you very much for that, Tertian fan. I greatly appreciate that. Uh, not found in the earliest layer of tradition. Even if we were to take that um, uh, and, and go with that statement, which we won't uh, because it's not true, it's biblical. It's found in the Bible, the fact that Mary has clearly taken a vow of perpetual virginity. But you can definitely find it in the early church. You can find it in the Proto-Evangelium of James. You can find it in Clement of Alexandria, Stormata, Book 7. You can find it in Gregory the Wonderworker. Origen, Ephraim, a number of fathers, especially uh, uh, Gregory the Wonder Worker, who's very clear uh, when he says that Mary desired to remain a virgin. So uh, a, a number of things, um, a number of, we can definitely find this in early tradition, well before the fourth century, um, definitely before the fourth century. And a number of these fathers before and after uh, recognized that Mary had taken a vow of virginity. So that's uh, keeping in line with what we find in the Bible. 
Uh, the fathers clearly taught it. You're not going to find any father unless unless you want to go. Um, and even that is disputed. But I'll concede the arch heretic uh, uh, Tertullian. Uh, unless you want to go with the arch heretic Tertullian or any other kind of uh, heretics, you don't find early fathers believing Mary ever had any children. It's a heresy uh, in the early church. Uh, we hear about new or not. There are a number of ways of tackling new or not, whether we want to refute it by looking at heos in the Greek or heos who. Uh, you really, either way you look at it, you find that there are many examples in the Bible that show uh, the contrary, that don't show that simply when you say uh, new or not until, until you have that term heos or heos who, that means that all of a sudden um, it is going to mean that uh, a state ceases or really even continues. It really all depends on the context. And we know that in the context of the text, the fact that Mary had taken a vow of virginity, everything we read, on when we identify, when we're able to identify who the brothers and sisters are, that they're not children. Notice, they're not the brothers and sisters from the same mother. They cannot be by virtue of the Greek word being utilized. But we read that uh, knew her not until is key phraseology. But 2 Samuel 6.23 uh, wouldn't fall in that line. You have the same Greek word there. Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child. So we have the negative there in the Greek again. Until the day of her death. Did she have any children after she died? I don't think she did. 1 Timothy 4.13, until I come, attend the public reading of Scripture, preaching, teaching. Uh, does it mean that uh, Timothy's going to stop when Paul comes? 1 Corinthians 15.25, Christ must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. I think you get the point of where we're going here. It doesn't mean that his reign is going to stop. Uh, uh, and on and on. There are numerous examples that can be brought up. The fact that there is no exclusivity in the usage of that Greek shows you that there are exceptions. And another thing I'd like to add, what is it that modern-day Protestantism can see that the most ancient, astute readers of the Greek language, like John Chrysostomos, were not able to see? a great saint and doctor of the church, much better at Greek than Tur Turgeon Fan and myself combined. And yet he thought it was a ludicrous argument. So that is something very important to point out. Not, and there's no father, none that interpreted the passages the way Turgeon Fan's interpreting them. What about firstborn son, Prototokos? We find Prototokos utilized in, in many different areas. It doesn't always mean that since you read firstborn, that you're then going to read, well, later on, um, there is uh, more births that are going to happen. It's also used for Israel. It's used in a number of different way ways. Um, it's used as a title of preeminence. You find it in Colossians 1.15. You find it in Psalm 89.27. Likewise, even God refers to Ephraim and the nation Israel, as I said, as his firstborn in Exodus 4.22. We need to be careful with the way we're utilizing these terms in Greek because we find all sorts of holes in, um, in these arguments. Uh, we read that the natural understanding is that he, he did know her, but Tyrton fan concedes that it's not explicitly stated. Well, I agree with him, and the fathers didn't believe that either. Matthew 13, Matthew, Mark 3, and many others where we read of the brothers and sisters. The problem is, is that these brothers and sisters in one area are called the Adelphos and Delphi, but they're then identified as, and, in, and we will look at that in a bit, in, in uh, Mark chapter 6, they're identified as not being, not being children from the same mother, not being children from the same womb. That's very important. Does taking a wife mean sex always has to be involved? No. Numbers 30, Josephus, show exceptions, and Sunerkomai does not mean sexual relations. My time is up. Like your uh, ringer there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. T fan, are you ready? I got it set for five minutes here. I'm ready. All right, go ahead. All right. Well, let's let's discuss the fathers first of all. I the Proto Evangelium of James, a work condemned uh, in the early church, officially condemned, if I recall correctly, by Pope Innocent the First in four oh five. Is not a church father. The, the author of the Evangelion of James, as far as we know, is not a church father. This is an, a book from outside the church. And it's, it may very well be the source of this erroneous tradition. As well, we may say that the, the tradition was bolstered by a misunderstanding of the value of virginity. 
people like John Chrysostom thought that it was more holy to remain a virgin than to be married. We see that in his discussion of virginity el elsewhere. So the fact that he may be persuaded that Mary, who's regarded as very holy by him, remained a virgin is, is completely understandable. It's wrong, but it's completely understandable. And it's more attributable to his tradition than to some kind of problem that he has understanding Greek. I certainly wouldn't dream of saying that John Chrysostom didn't understand Greek. That's not the issue at all. The issue is that he had a very powerful tradition that he had adopted that exalted virginity beyond its place. It's not what the scriptures teach us. It's not more holy for a married woman to be a, to remain virgin than it is for her to be with her husband. Paul explicitly tells us that that's not what husband and wife should be doing together. As for Isaiah 7, which was quoted, indeed, this is a prophecy that a virgin would conceive and give birth, but there's no prophecy that she will remain a virgin. What about Judges 11 and Jephthah's vow? In, in there, uh, the one similarity that one might point to is that there's an acknowledgement by the young woman in the text that she's going to follow what Jephthah had said. So there's this uh, consent, if you will. But the two months that she's by herself up on the mountains is not the same as three months that uh, after which uh, Mary went to go see uh, her cousin, Elizabeth. Nor do, do we see Elizabeth or, or Mary arriving to Elizabeth in mourning as Jephthah's daughter did. Jephthah's daughter went there to bewail her virginity. And, not, and there was a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in a year. That's from this Judges 1140. So no, it, it's not the case that this is some kind of uh, proto-Marian uh, promise, nor is there anything in the context. We were told that, that the, in the context there's a, an oath of virginity. Absolutely not. There's not absolutely no vow of virginity mentioned in the New Testament text. That's, that's just completely mistaken. What about the question of whether it, can, it, whether it cannot be his brother and sister because of the Greek word being utilized? Again, that's not correct. Those are the normal terms for brother and sister in Greek. There's not some kind of, it's not some kind of special Greek word that can't mean brother or sister. And in fact, while there are some cases where a brother, the term brother might be used outside of that uh, meaning. So for example, there you might talk about half brothers using the term brother. Interestingly enough, scripture doesn't have any examples that we see of the word sister being similarly utilized for female cousins or something like that, and as it happens. But in any event, these are the normal, the normal meaning of both brother and sister are brother and sister, meaning that they are the children of the same parents, which was presumably Joseph to the outside world and Mary. The... Uh, we also see some other uh, points when Jesus went to Egypt. We didn't see anybody going with him except Joseph and Mary. There's no mention of some older half-siblings or cousins going with them then. But when Jesus is grown, now there are these siblings that are hanging out with Mary. We could go on and on about this. The Tertullian, whether he's an arch-heretic or whether he's orthodox, uh, he's, he's not really the point. I, I suppose the point is that he is one of the people early on who brings up the fact, that a denial of the perpetual virginity of Mary. He's sometimes called the father of Latin Christianity, uh, but certainly he did wander into error, uh, especially later in life. What about the fundamentals of Catholic dogma? What's interesting there is the acknowledgement that the, Mary's virginity after the birth of Jesus was denied in the early church by Tertullian. You know, uh, not, I'm out of time. But I'll have to either pick that up later in cross-examination. There we go. All right. So <clears throat> now we have two cross-examinations, uh, 20 minutes each. William Euclid, he reset my timer here. 20. All right. Ready when you are. We will begin now. Church and friend, when I mention the Greek word not meaning brothers and sisters, I was not talking about Adelphos and Adelphi. I'm referring to 
we have brothers and sisters. We're told that there's a brothers and sisters of Christ in Mark chapter 6, and then we were literally told that they are his singanusin. We read that the brothers of Christ are his kin. And so my question to you is, where is this Greek word ever used for brothers or sisters of the same womb? So which which uh, which Greek word, uh, which verse are you, do you have in mind here in Mark 6 that you're talking about? Mark chapter 6, you can begin verse 3, we have to begin. Because verse 3 says, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brothers of James, Joseph, Jude, Jude, Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And then we read onwards, and he replies and said, prophets are not with, uh, without honor, except in their hometown, and among their own kin, referring to his brothers and sisters. Where is the Greek word there, singinus, and where is it ever used for brothers and sisters of the same womb? Okay, well, uh... I guess my my first comment about that would be to point out that this is not necessarily referring to his brothers and sisters. This is, if you look at the context of what he's saying, he says, a, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. So right. country so and- though, right? So country would be the broadest category, kin would be a, a smaller category, and house would be the smallest category. So let me be clear here. He's identifying the brothers and sisters. He's saying kinsmen, but he's not referring to them. Who would he be referring to there then? If it says his own house, who on earth could he be referring to there? Well, he, he could be referring to uh, the people that are mentioned in Luke uh, 244, I suppose. But you do uh, realize we're in we're in the Gospel of Mark, though. I do realize that. But you asked me the question, who he could be referring to. Sure. But in the context, he just mentioned his brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. And then he says, a prophet is not without honor amongst his own kin. In the context, doesn't it make it logical? Isn't it logical? Clearly, he's referring to them. We have numerous fathers that make that identification. What is it that you see here in the text that indicates that he's not referring to his brothers and sisters? I would be delighted to answer that, uh, as I did already, by pointing out that there are three, that it's a funnel mentioned here. At the broadest category, country. That's not only his brothers. When he says country, he doesn't mean only his brothers. Then, among his kin. Now we're talking about a smaller group. As in the other passage I mentioned, kin can be a broader category. It doesn't have to be his... Uh, the people of his own house, the narrowest category that he comes to in just a second. and uh, But it's a broader category. So when Jesus was lost on the way back from Jerusalem by Mary and Joseph, and they were looking for him, they looked among their kinsfolk, This the same term, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, this is a broader category. And then the narrowest category is house. And that would be the category in his own house that would refer to his brothers. We're literally told among their own kin and in their own house. Are the kin, are the kinsfolk not in the house? Well, I suppose that I, you should tell me that because if they are in their own house, if these are kinsfolk that are in the own house, then kinsfolk seems to refer to people who are living in the same household. I agree. But the, the term that's used uh, in, that this term is used much more broadly than that in scripture. So well, what term is that? Let me get clarification. I apologize. What what term is used much more broadly? This uh sungenes. Okay. It's, it's a blood relative uh, or right. more broadly a country. I, I, I agree that they would be in the house. We agree there. No, no, we 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 don't agree there. I, oh, I'm you so, don't I, think they're in the house then. I know I'm saying that this term, the same term is used in Romans 9, 3 by Paul saying he wishes he could be accursed from Christ for his brethren, his kinsmen according to the flesh. So you can see he's, he's, expand, he's using the term more expansively than not just the people that lived in his house. He's using it to I refer to everyone who's Jewish. I think, I think the fact that he's interchanging them, uh, Adelphos, I think he's interchanging them, brothers and kinsmen, I think that's another usage of it being interchangeable. It's using it in a synonymous manner. That's what I think, which is why I'm asking you, if I'm looking at it here in the Greek, it says, he, first off, we read of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and the sisters. 
they took offense. And then he says to them, not to some other people, he's talking to them. And he's a prophet, of course, we believe. Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown and among their own kin. That would be his own kin. Wouldn't that be logically referring to them? Wouldn't it be logical he's referring to them as a singing use in here? So, uh, no, it's, what's more logical is that the house refers to his brothers and that the, the other ones are broader categories. Just as countrymen, doesn't, the, in his own country, doesn't refer only to his brothers, so the broader category of kinsfolk doesn't. He uses a similar uh, discussion in Luke 21, 16. He says, you shall be betrayed both by parents and brothers and kinsfolks, referring to using that same Greek word, and friends. So he uses this as one of many categories in, in more than one place, not necessarily referring to brothers as coextensive with kinsfolk. There are a number of fathers. I'm reminded of Augustine, um, Ambrose, and others, that when they read Mark 6, they read it the way that I'm reading it, as well as Jerome. Why is it that a person like Jerome a great biblicist is able to read the Greek and recognize there that the kinsmen are being referred to, are, are the brothers that were just referred to, but you're unable to see that. What is What kind of insight do you have that perhaps the fathers don't have? I suppose that, uh, we, I suppose we could, try, we could try to walk through each father that you have in mind and, and explore what exactly they're saying about the text. But even assuming that there is this mountain of other uh, fathers who believe that sex is evil and dirty and that's only, uh, you know, good use is to conceive children. And that's kind of just an excuse for it. And really it would be better to be uh, uh, completely abstain from sex. With that mentality in mind and those glasses on, it's easy to understand why someone could could come to a wrong conclusion about uh, text of scripture, even when this text is fairly clear. And I'm not burdened, thankfully, by that particular tradition. I don't have to. I, I've been. I've read Paul a little bit more carefully on that point, I suppose, or simply I just don't have that tradition in Protestantism. I I, I want to read ways, some words for you. I'm sorry, what? I, I apologize. I want to read some words for you. You tell me what you think of them. Okay. Uh, the teaching of Mary being perpetual virgin is piously believed with human faith from the consent of the ancient church. Do you know who said those words? Uh, I, I don't know. I suppose that the person who said that is somebody who has been uh, associated with this tradition. Perhaps it was somebody who was just breaking with that tradition, perhaps somebody like Martin Luther or John Calvin or even Francis Turretin. It is Francis Turretin. So I, I, I guess that does lead to my question would be, what is it that you are able to see in the text that the very, uh, that the real Francis Turretin could not see in all of text? In fact, uh, he mentions, he calls as, as you well know, well know, he calls this a silly argument, the argument of Prototokos and Adelphos and Adelphi. What can you see there that the real Francis Turretin simply cannot see? Well, I, I would say that to a certain extent, at least, my opening speech speaks for itself on that point. However, I would say if you want to go, if you want to dig deeper and you want more explanation uh, on that point, you could look at my specific responses to Jerome's responses to Helvidius, because Calvin and Turretin tend to not to dig into this. And the reason, one of the reasons at least, why they didn't tend to dig into this is because it wasn't part of the first wave of Protestant responses to Rome. So you, you understand that uh, this wasn't one of those points where Protestants and Roman Catholics were arguing in that first uh, generation well, of reform, it, reformation. It, and it, so, it, it, I'm not going to, to um, answer that because it's my cross-examination, but I, I, would, I would agree that in the beginning they didn't argue that, but I think that that later did become uh, contentious, but uh, perhaps the qu uh, questions for uh, another day. In Matthew 1, 3 to 18, multiple times Matthew lists women, and each time he lists all of their children. Why is it that Mary's list only includes Christ? if you're asserting 
that she had other children. Hmm. So if you're, you're saying, why doesn't uh, Matthew mention that Jesus' brothers are James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, as Matthew points out in Matthew 13, 55? No, not at all. I'm asking, why when Matthew's listing women with all of her children in Matthew 1, why is it that Mary's list only includes Christ if she I, have? I'm sorry, I misunderstood. So you said in Matthew 1, why, oh. is, why are the other children not mentioned? Why? Why? Could, because he is listing women and then listing them with all of their children. Why, if there are other children Mary had, why are they not listed? Well, let's explore that. So uh, you mentioned that Tamar, for example, in, in Matthew 1, 3, Tamar, it's mentioned that Tamar begat Pharaoh's and Zara, right? Is that is that that's one of the examples you have in mind? Sure. Matthew uh, 1, Matthew mm -hmm. 1, 5, again, Matthew 1, 5, 1, 6, and then uh, 1, 16 and 18. Yeah, and then Matthew 1, 6, it, it mentions that David, the king, begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. But what's not mentioned in Matthew 1, 6 is the child that passed away in punishment of David's sin right. before, before Solomon's birth. So, in fact, the argument isn't, isn't sound. Right, living children, though. At, at, at the time, why, why are, and they would be living, the brothers wouldn't be dead. Why are they not listed in Matthew 1? Well, first of all, of course, the, the focal point in Matthew 1 is the birth of Jesus. And at the birth of Jesus, he didn't have any brothers. Right. But it's talking about every time he lists women, mm -hmm. and, then he, and then he gets to the generation of Christ. It's not just reducing it to that. There's a list of children that women have. So at the time that he's writing this, if the, these people existed already, James, Joseph, Judas, Simon, why are they not listed there? I I don't think, I think you're mistaken. I mean, there. first of all, both Rahab and Ruth are mentioned in Matthew 1, 5, and none of their other children are mentioned. Solomon, we know he, that we know that Bathsheba uh, is, had another child, and it's not mentioned here in Matthew 1, 6. So there's no... Uh, you know, kind of secret formula that we should be expecting that, that, other, that Mary's other children are mentioned here, and they're not. It, in fact, it's just that's not the that's just simply not the correct way of understanding the text at all. It actually tells you in Matthew Matthew one three, Judah bore two children, Perez and Zerah, from the rites of Tamar. That's one true. five, Solomon bore the total of one child from Rahab. So certain individuals bearing children with women, Obed bore the total of one child from Ruth. So we do have a clear pattern here of the women that are being listed here. There's an emphasis on the children, and there's only one child listed for Mary as well. Do you not see that pattern? I, I deny that that's, that's a, an accurate assessment. Uh, I, as I pointed out, a counterexample already. But you agree that every time it lists the women with their children, it clearly lists their offspring? No. You don't agree, even though it says the total number of children there. You don't agree? I, I absolutely don't agree. Okay. Um, you brought up Helvidius. And you do you agree with Helvidius that Victorinus rejected the perpetual rigidity of Mary? Uh, my recollection on Helvidius is that Helvidius own writing only exists for us in the form of Jerome's quotations and rebuttals. And I don't recall the extent to which uh, to, to which the Victorianus is, is, is brought up. And I also don't know whether we have, assuming that it was, I don't know if we even have the writing that was in mind. I don't recall reading anything specifically from uh, Victorinus on okay. this topic. That's very, that, that's that's perfect. Then, if if, you, if you're not aware of anything, that's perfect. You brought up come together. Sunercomai. Where is Sunercomai used for sexual relations in the New Testament? 
And if you do point to 1 Corinthians 7, 5, are you aware that that is not the most ancient reading? Okay. So if so, you can provide a, a reference to sonarchomai, come together, that means sexual relations. Are you able to provide that for us? I guess, I suppose my... my uh, clarifying question to you is, is your question about what does the text mean? No, that you mentioned that come together, you said it more than once, come together clearly means sexual. Then you quoted 1 Corinthians 7, 5, you quoted a textual variant. Where, uh, where in the text, where is there ever an example of come together meaning sexual in all of the New Testament? I, I would say that uh, offhand, I don't recall any other case, but it, uh, as well, I would also say... Outside of a textual variant that the fathers don't attest to, because if you look at the earliest fathers, they don't attest to that reading. Outside of a textual variant, is it correct for the audience that you cannot name a single area where come together means sexual? Well... Since you've raised the question of textual variant, I suppose we should uh, we should ask whether whether that is indeed the text. And uh, I, I guess my my suggestion on that would be to look at what your church says the text is. I have looked at it, uh, and your church to tells us that the uh, the readings of the Vulgate are authentic, right? The oldest readings of the Vulgate don't have that. They don't have that reading. None of the Latin fathers have that reading. You don't have that in Cyprian. You don't have it in Jerome. You don't have it in Origen. So that is the question that I have, is that you're using a textual variant and saying that is the normal reading of Sunerkomai, which is sexual. Can you give us an the Vulgate, the version of the Vulgate that Pope Clement authorized says at iterum revertamini, which I can't see how that that doesn't mean and come together again. Right. Uh, so, I am telling you. Well, hold, hold on, though. Where, where are you? What are you reading? What text are you reading? I'm reading the text of the Clementine Vulgate, the one authorized by the Pope what, of your church. What passage are you reading? What passage am I reading? First Corinthians. Okay. Seven, verse right. five. Right. But we're talking about it meaning something sexual. All of the early references, Jerome, Cyprian, any of those readings, we're talking about the most ancient reading of this text because you quoted 1 Corinthians. Obviously, you're quoting it from the Greek. You're saying come together naturally means sexual. Where does this mean sexual in the Greek? I agree. Hold on. Let me make a clarification. I agree once we get to the 7th century and onwards, we do have this variant that appears. It's in the Byzantine form text. But I'm asking you as part of the original text. You told the audience to Nerkomai come together means sexual. Where? In what original? Okay, so there's two different questions that you have. There, one question would be whether the text of the New Testament, orig or whether Paul originally wrote the word, and the, se the that's one question. And the other question is, does it refer to something sexual? I can't tell from your question whether you're trying to challenge what the, Vul the Vulgate's reading here as no, not authentic. Not that. I, 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 I do not agree with you. I, I disagree with your reading of the Vulgate. I okay, don't agree. Well, it's my, well, it's, would you at least, would you accept the translation provided by the, the Remists? The translation? Yes, the, the Remist translation, which says, and return together again. Right. It doesn't mean come together sexually is what I mean. But do you accept that that's an authentic translation, the return together again? It's my cross-examination time. So mm -hmm. my question to you is if you could name any ancient source. So I have 20 seconds. Okay. Are you able to name any ancient source that uses Sunerkamai, come together in a sexual fashion? Uh, I think that it's clear from the context that 1 Corinthians 7, 5, if we accept this reading as original, which your church seems to say it, it is, then uh, that text would be an example of the text using that phrase, assuming that's the Greek word. If it's a different Greek word, it's a different Greek word. Right. My time is up. 
Yeah, I've got 20, 20 minutes. So. All right, so let me reset the clock here. And fam, you have 20 minutes beginning now. So first, a quick apology for uh, occupying some of the answer time with a question. Uh, We, we talked briefly about uh, the issue of knew her not until, and there's the underlying Greek word, but isn't this, or do, don't you agree that there is a natural sense in which didn't do this until that often, but not always, implies that the thing happened after this consequent point? Um, in the context of Matthew 1, mm -hmm by virtue of the fact that we clearly have Mary having taken a perpetual vow of virginity, and then we recognize what is being said there, we recognize the language being utilized there, mm -hmm. I think it is very clear when we, and, and even sticking to scripture alone, I think it's very clear there that they were never going to have sexual relations, even after their houses came together, because that's how soon Erkomai is used. Come together. You find the very same region in Jeremiah uh, with the Sunerkamai and Oikos. That is what we're talking about. How is it coming together? So I think that's very obvious. And then when you supplement that with a unanimous, unanimous teaching of the early church fathers, it's no, there's no doubt there that it's not talking about future sexual relations. Uh, that wasn't my question, though. My question was a more general question. Can chaos or chaos who ever mean that a state is going to cease? Of course. But in the context, it doesn't mean it here. So the first go-to point that you raised in your answer just now, and I think also in one of your previous speeches, was this idea that in the context, she had taken a vow of yes. virginity. Which verse says that she took a vow of virginity? When she says, I, she knew not man. How, how, how can it be since I know not man? What is happening there is, we have, and not only there, we have a number of connections to the Greek of Judges 11 and the Septuagint. The perpetual vow of virginity that Jephthah's daughter was put under by the father, of course, by Jephthah, we recognize the typological references that Mary is hearkening to. Mary is clearly hearkening back to that. The language being utilized there, the parallelism is shocking. When we recognize what is being said there, exact Greek phraseology that appears nowhere else Nowhere else before 100 AD, nowhere else in all of Greek literature, she knew not man. How can this be? Let this be done unto me. We recognize she's taken a perpetual vow of virginity when we supplement that with the fathers that also made that connection, and then other fathers that talk about Mary's, Mary's vow of virginity as well. We okay, finally so I have, I'm sorry. there. I'm sorry about that. So no I, have two, I have two follow-up questions on that point. And I don't want to, I'm mentioning the two because I don't want to forget that I have a second one. Sure. The first follow up question is uh, Isn't there another way that that could be understood and that Protestants typically do understand it, which is that she means she understood this as being that she's going to have a child shortly and that she's confused because she's still a virgin now? Isn't, isn't that a possible, is a possible understanding of that text? No, it wouldn't be a possible understanding because she was already, uh, typically, as you know very well, that Greek there, word there for betrothed. Uh, you look at the usage of that in the Old Testament, the Septuagint, the very same Greek word utilized by Josephus. You recognize that in Jewish culture, Josephus had rights to her already. So uh, that very, fa very fact that they were already betrothed Yet they hadn't had sexual relations, and Mary, I imagine Mary was of such an age where she would have known sexual, how sexual relations are had. Her response is one of shock. Indeed, if you read the word biblical commentary, they note, even if you read the liberal Raymond Brown, they note the kind of unusual language being utilized here by Mary. When we look at the fact that she's saying, how can this be since I know not man? When we look at all Greek literature and only see it appearing in one other area, and notice that the fathers are making that connection as well. I think it is very clear Mary is noting she has taken a perpetual vow of virginity, like Jephthah's daughter was vowed perpetually. Aside, so that actually leads me to my second question, uh, which is, 
And I, I okay, uh, just checking the time. The second question that follow, that follow up is in in Jewish culture at the time, what would be the motivation for Mary to take such an oath of virginity? Assuming that that's the real reason why she's so confused is because she took an oath of virginity and she can't figure out how that um, how she's going to have a child because of this vow. What would have motivated her to, to make such a vow? And uh, if so, it, it, and you know, if there is some motivation, what is that motivation? It can't. I assume it's not the same as the motivation for Jephthah's daughter. Not at all. The motivation of Jephthah's daughter is quite different. What the, the motivation would have been, um, and I agree completely with the great Francis Turton when he says that the motivation was the fact that Joseph would be her her caretaker. As as uh, as somebody that uh, subscribes to ancient Christianity, I believe it was because Mary. Mary was trying, was living her holiest, holiest of lives. She was trying to live out the life as best as she could in the temple. And then we recognize the great things that have been done to her, she says. I think it winds up perfectly with what we see in Numbers 30. Women that are married, that have taken perpetual vows of virginity, it wasn't something unusual. You can find it having been done in history. Early church father uh, Remigius and Primacius note that it was common. Josephus mentions it as well. So it's something that was not, uh, definitely not as common as, as a woman married and having sexual relations, but the Holy Family was nothing that was common. The Holy Family was a very unique family. And I think that answers it for you there. The fact that it was such a unique, special family, that that is why Mary's clear perpetual vow of virginity was so important. The fathers catch that, they know that, they knew that very well. Augustine knew it. Gregory of Nyssa knew it. Excuse me. And, excuse me. And Ambrose knew it. My understanding of Jewish culture at the time is that virginity was considered shameful. And that, uh, in fact, if you read the Old Testament, you see that it's a sign, it, there's a concern among women, not only not to remain virgins, but also to not remain barren. And that barrenness is viewed in a negative light. And we actually see that in the New Testament in the case of uh, Elizabeth being an old woman and not having had children. This is something that's, uh, that's considered a problem for her. And uh, my question then would be, if, if that is indeed the, the culture, it seems as though your only option is to suggest that Mary was, had taken this vow of virginity for some special reason that was not that was outside the culture of the time, rather than no, one I, that was consistent with the culture of the time. No, I, just, I just gave you multiple examples of it being consistent with the culture. Um, so no, I completely disagree with you. I think we have a number of examples of it being consistent with the culture. So if I can give you examples, we have different groups. We have even Philo of Alexandria that lists groups of Jews that were married, Jewish women that were married, aged women that had taken perpetual vows of virginity. If Josephus sees this important enough to bring this up in book five of his um, uh, uh, The Jewish War, if he views it, views this so importantly that he lists it, and we find it in Numbers 30, the fathers recognize it, I don't think it is out of the norm at all. It was something that would happen not as often as those that were married. And to add to, to answer your question about the shame, the, the shame aspect, I think the shame aspect was when a woman was married and desired children and was barren and couldn't have children. Nowhere does the text ever say that there was shame uh, by merely uh, uh, getting married, taking a vow of being a uh, perpetual virgin, and they were then shamed. In fact, we recognize, if we look at Numbers uh, numbers uh, 30, the vows were accepted by the husbands as well, a number of times in old Jewish culture. Let me ask the question... Or let me let me point out to you that the tradition associated with Jephthah's daughter was for her uh, for the young women of Israel to lament her, that her virginity. Why do you suppose, if it wasn't something problematic, that they would lament it instead of extolling it or praising it? 
That's a fantastic point. A number of things we realize are typological shadows of the Old Testament. We find um, a reason for sorrow in the book of Genesis 3, but on the flip side, the, the typological prophecy of the Messiah that would come in the mother is a view of something positive to come. Indeed, the story of Jephthah's daughter is one of sad sadness. She bewails her perpetual virginity. She dies having been vowed a perpetual virgin. But then we look at the flip side, Mary being the new daughter of Jephthah. There is happiness. There is joy. There is rejoicing in the fact that she has not been vowed by force, but it's the positive kind of typology come to fruition. Indeed, she has taken this vow. Joseph has accepted it. And she has remained a perpetual virgin, as all of the early church fathers taught. There's not a single father that taught differently. All of them taught this in unison, that Mary remained a perpetual virgin. And a number of them that decided to comment on Judges 11, they viewed that connection. So we have the most astute fathers making this connection. It didn't just fall out of thin air. The great defenders of the faith and Bible saw that connection. Speaking of falling out of thin air, it seems that this idea that uh, virginity was something praiseworthy it has is exactly that because in fact when we look at Isaiah 4 in verse 1 it says in that day seven women will take hold of one man saying we'll eat our own bread and wear our own apparel only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach doesn't that reflect what I was just saying before that in the culture of Israel in the ancient Near East culture of Israel there was actually a preference for marriage and family over against perpetual virginity. No doubt at all that that would have been the norm. But that wasn't the question you asked me. The question you asked me is if that was exclusive or not. And it's not exclusive because, sure, would it have been the norm? Of course, the norm is somebody gets married, they get together, they have sexual relations. But we see the flip side of that. We see exceptions. And then when we notice the clear language being utilized by Mary there as her having taken this vow of virginity, we recognize Mary is an exception in the whole, everything of the Holy Family is something unique in, in church history. And we recognize this isn't out of the norm. Sure, the usual thing would have been getting married and having sexual relations, but you recognize in Josephus, Philo of Alexandria, and in the Bible itself, there are people that are married that have taken perpetual vows of virginity. So let's explore that question about the uh, what Josephus says. You, you quoted Josephus, Wars of the Jews, if, I correct, if I'm correct. You said book five, is that correct? Correct. In what, what chapter of book five? Uh, I'm not entirely sure what chapter. If you look at what he says about the cloisters, uh, you will find it there. He mentions aged women, talks about, it, it, it's a lot, it's a lot there. He talks about uh, aged women there, talks about them being uh, perpetual virgins. So if yeah. I'm, I, I'm, I'm looking at, at his, I'm looking at the text and the term virgin in, in the English translation of Josephus uh, only appears in one footnote, uh, footnote 44, and in, uh, in chapter six of book two, it doesn't appear at all in book five. So I'm, I'm questioning this citation. Yeah, I will get it for you. Um, we have it in, um, actually it's Jewish war book six, paragraph 356 and 357 here. And I will find Um, you want me to read it for you? Absolutely. Okay. Here we go. Josephus tells us in um, that some of the Essenes would voluntarily abstain from relations for several years. One variant says three years. Some say permanently. And then we've got another one. Let me read more. He mentions the Therapeutae, which consisted of celibate Jewish men and aged virgins, Parthenoi. Parthenoi. So we have Josephus in Jewish war clearly mentioning people that are perpetual virgins. They're married. They're abstaining from sexual relations. And we have Philo of Alexandria as well mentioning aged virgins 
So we have two ancient Jewish sources, and Philo, you can find them on the Contemplative Life 68. So we have two ancient Jewish sources, both of them lining up with exactly what we read in Numbers chapter 30, that this is not something unusual. So I, I guess I, I'm still confused about the what what exactly are Josephus' words? What's the quotation from Josephus? Not the, not some paraphrase from some secondary source. Um let's see. Uh it would be uh John the Essene to the topic of Thalma and Lydda was also added to the portion. So it's a whole paragraph. I mean, I'm pretty sure you don't want me to read the whole paragraph here. It's so the, the reference to John the Essene, there's a reference in chapter two of book three to, of John the Essene. I found that, but there's I don't see any other reference to him. Right. So what what exactly is is your question? You're yeah, I think it's a made-up quotation. I don't think it's true. That's my you question. I'm, I'm, I'm asking, giving you a chance to document it, and, and I don't see it coming out. You know, then Josephus talks about the Essenes having taken vows of virginity. You don't. I don't see it in the Jewish wars. I don't know if it's if you got the wrong book or if he doesn't say it at all, or I have a bad translation. But I'm looking for this quotation, and I'm not finding it. Uh, I just read it to you right here, where he says of the Jews and the Essenes. I just read it to you, where he talks about the lot having taken vows of virginity. It's right here in Jewish war. I read you, I read you Philo of Alexandria as well. Okay, so what's the what's the citation of Philo the, in of Alexandria? Philo of Alexandria. Uh, let me go back. Here we go. Philo is on the contemplative life 68. He talks about the Therapeutae. If you look up the name of the Jewish sect, he has, they have kept their chastity, not under compulsion, like some of the Greek priestesses, but of their own free will. So you have Josephus in one area, you have Philo of Alexandria in the other, and you have Numbers 30 as well. You have multiple examples in Judaism of people keeping their perpetual vows of virginity. So if we take the the therapeutai that Philo mentions, would these be members of the sect of the Pharisees? Um, I think that they're a completely different sect. Yes. I think so, they're a completely offshoot, completely different sect. They're mm -hmm. called the therapeutai. So within Judaism, there are a number of different sects, as you know. So you have clear examples in Josephus. You have it in Philo. Regardless if they're the Pharisees or not, I don't see how that's relevant. What you have here are clear examples of people that, are, that have taken vows of virginity. And I'm sure you found it already. You recognize it here. What do we read here? They're aged virgins. The Greek word is parthenoi. They've kept their chastity, and it hasn't been done under compulsion. But of their own free will, I read the complete quote for you. That is the exact quote. Aged virgins who have kept their chastity, not under compulsion, like some of the Greek priestesses, but of their own free will. The Greek word is parthenoi there. So at, at 68, we see... We do see some in, in, in this text you mentioned. It says, and the women also share in this feast, the greater part of whom, though old, are virgins in respect of their purity, not indeed the, through necessity, as some of the priestesses among the Greeks are. Uh, I don't agree with that. To preserve it, their chastity more than they would have done of their own accord, but out of an admiration for and love of wisdom, with which they are so desirous to pass their lives, on account of which they are indifferent to the pleasures of the body, desiring not a mortal but an immortal offspring. Yeah, I, is, I, I just want to add, I don't agree with that uh, that translation. It says not under their not under compulsion. So they were not forced to keep their chastity. It's been done under their own free will. Well, not not indeed through necessity, not through compulsion. Is it's the the meaning is about the same. Uh, my point is not to dispute that portion of your quotation, but my point is to suggest that this. Uh, this sect that Philo references, uh, these are, are they women who have taken a vow? 
definitely says it right there. They're aged virgins, they're Parthenoi, and they have kept their chastity. Mm -hmm. Look but at the where, where's they've, the vow, though? They've kept, they've remained a virgin, and it hasn't been done under compulsion. So hold on, wait, wait, wait a minute, though. You didn't ask about a vow alone, though. 20 minutes, so yeah. In a virgin in Jewish culture. All right. All right. Um, for our next part here, let's see. We have um, two seven minute closing statements. Let me go ahead and change my clock here. Uh, William, beginning with you, are you ready? I am ready. I will put my timer now. Okay. Thank you very much for that, uh, Turton fan. I greatly appreciated that. I think the one thing that we have got to take away from everything that we've noticed in this debate is that not a single early father was, was ever disputed as having clearly taught that Mary remained a perpetual virgin. We recognize that clearly Mary remained. She took a vow, as we notice in the book of Judges 11. We connect that to Luke 1. We recognize that the fathers make that connection as well. That was never contested. We recognize that clearly. We notice that when we look at Mark chapter 6, when we look and we read that these are his kinsmen, the brothers and sisters are identified as his singanusen. There's no doubt about it. Christ is responding identifying them as his singanusen. When Christ identifies them as his singanusen, that term in the Greek is never utilized, ever, for a brother or a sister of the same womb. You never find it there. Furthermore, we busted that fallacious argument of sunerkomai. The fact that a textual variant is what is being relied upon. But nowhere will you look into the New Testament do you find come together, meaning sexual. Rather, it is the coming together of the houses. We never read anything in regards to any act of sex Mary ever had. None of the children that Mary had, oh, the only child Mary had was Christ. None of the children that Mary had traveling with her, that was a clear point, are from her womb. None, that is the point that Mark 6 makes. None of the children traveling with Mary are from her own womb. These are called the singanusen of Christ. All of the early fathers that interpreted and looked at that passage recognized that. Is a perpetual vow virginity odd? No, you can find it in Numbers 30. You can find it in Judges 11. Clearly, we saw how the fathers made those interpretations and connections as well. We saw how Josephus speaks of the Essenes being under a vow of virginity as well. We read about Josephus in the Jewish War. We read of Philo of Alexandria, how there were Jews that were not under compulsion, remained chaste. They're old. They're aged. They're called Parthenoi. So the examples are there. But indeed, examples aren't everything. The strongest evidence is in the Bible itself, which is clearly what Church and Fan was not able to deal with. The vow that is taken in Judges 11, Mary is hearkening to that vow. There is no doubt that Mary is hearkening to that vow. Zero doubt. What about Haos who? We heard of Haos until... But there are a number of examples, even when the usage is, is used to the negative, but 2 Samuel 6, 23, where, and Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child until the day of her death. This was something that was utilized often, the usage of chaos in this manner. Very often, it didn't always mean, well, until, and then they're going to, um, well, obviously, it, it, there's no possible way that she would have had children after she died. It is nonsensical. I asked her Tin Fan about the lists in Matthew 1. He was very wrong there. He said that I was reading it wrong when I was just reading Holy Writ, how the women's children are listed there. All of the women Matthew lists in Matthew 1. Then we have Christ, the only child from Mary. There's a clear point that is being made here.
And he clearly missed that. Clearly, clearly missed that. We heard about, um, well, first off, uh, uh, Tertullian. Tertullian, an arch heretic. By the way, even that can be contested. But I have no desire to speak of an arch heretic or try and defend an arch heretic. But even he is not clear. We read of even the very Francis Turretin. Francis Turretin himself, who called these arguments ridiculous, he thought that they were the silliest of arguments. We heard of Prototokos, even though Prototokos firstborn, it doesn't mean that there will be children afterwards. None of this makes sense. None of the fathers read the text in this way. Not a single early father ever read any of these texts in this way. None of them looked in Matthew, looked at the brothers and sisters, and identified them as the children of Mary. None of them did that. At best, Turretin fans' best source is Helvidius, an Arian monk. And I ask you, would you rather fall on the side of Cyril of Alexandria, Ambrose of Milan, the great John Chrysostom, Jerome, Gregory of Nyssa, Basil, Hilary of Poitiers, Origen, Ephraim, Gregory the Wonder Worker, Clement of Alexandria, or an Arian monk. Imagine that, the origin of these arguments within Arianism. Turretin Van has a clear insight into scripture that not even Francis Turretin had. Not even his own namesake read any of the passages in this way. The Protestant reformers believed Mary likely remained a perpetual virgin her whole life. And I say likely because if you read Ulrich Zwingli, he says it's very likely. The ancient church taught it. Francis Turretin said the ancient church taught it. Indeed, the reason being is in Judges 11, as we pointed out, there is a clear, clear point being made in Judges 11 when Mary says, "How I, I know not man. How can this be? I know not man. Quoting the exact words you find from Jephthah's daughter, which refer to a vow virginity. Ambrose saw it, Ephraim saw it, and the fathers recognized it. That is why it has been taught from the very beginning. Thank you very much. Excellent. All right. Let me start it over here. All right. Seven minutes. You ready? I'm just resetting my timer. Okay, now I'm ready. Sure. All right. Go ahead. Thanks. We've heard a lot of interesting discussion today. I think the careful listener will have heard the main points I wanted to raise, which are, first of all, that Joseph did not know Mary until she had brought forth her firstborn son, which in its most natural understanding is that he knew her afterwards. And if that's the case, if that's the right understanding, the most natural understanding, uh, then that solves our entire uh, debate right there. But of course, as has been pointed out, occasionally this terminus is does not imply that the, the, the state didn't change. So if something happened until the day of the person's death or that uh, something's gonna happen until, that uh, Christ will reign until all his enemies are put under his feet and so on and so forth. In not every case it, does the context imply that there's a termination. Now, if the context had said that there is a vow of virginity, we, we would have something to deal with, something some reason not to think that this meant that normal marital relations took place. But in quite the op opposite of having a vow of virginity, we have a vow of marriage mentioned in the text. She was betrothed to Joseph. That quite the, the, the vows that are mentioned, is, although not explicit, of course, but she is described as betrothed. Now, whether you take betrothed in as meaning this state of kind of uh, engagement in, in the modern terms, of course, it's not exactly identical to modern engagement, but in any event, the, the, the context doesn't support this idea of a vow of virginity. There was a vow that's oddly mentioned in Judges. Then Numbers 30 was mentioned, but it mentions vows generally, but it doesn't mention any vow of virginity. But even Jephthah's vow, this is, uh, and a very odd vow taken not by the daughter herself, but by the father, and then affirmed by the daughter. And 
she laments it. She laments her virginity. This is not something that's more holy or more praiseworthy. It's something that was commemorated as a mourning by the daughters of Israel, not as something to, for her to be proud of. So there's no reason to suppose that Mary was somehow engaged in the same Jephthite uh, act. Moreover, there's explicit mention of Jesus' brothers, which we, we saw numerous verses, and sisters, which we saw two verses. So again, these are uh, explicitly stated. And in fact, Matthew does mention the names of Jesus' brothers, James, Joses, Simon, and Judas. His sisters aren't mentioned by name, but he had sisters, as we saw from two passages in the New Testament as well. The, uh, the argument that Jesus' brothers weren't mentioned in his genealogy is frankly absurd. The, uh, as we mentioned already, there is at least one other brother from Bathsheba that isn't mentioned in the text. And there's no reason for us to suppose that in the other cases, the only child, only one child was mentioned for two of the other women. And the reason for mentioning Pharaohs and Tamar is that they're always mentioned together like that, or, or typically mentioned like that, even in blessings of uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish women. The, the idea of getting twins is, is kind of a blessing and, and is that's how that's why they're mentioned together because they're twins the uh, mary was joseph's wife and the holy and the, and an angel of the lord told joseph to take mary his wife it, there's really nothing take unto him mary his his wife it, there's really nothing that could be more explicit than that he's supposed to treat her as his wife not that he's supposed to just be her bodyguard but take unto her your wife so the idea is Yes, he was going to be her husband and she was going to be her wife. We know from the rest of the New Testament what that entails, and that entails them being one flesh. So with that context, it's pretty clear that Mary did indeed have relations. And again, if we go to Revelation 12, which wasn't directly addressed, uh, she, this woman that's mentioned in Revelation 12, if, as it is insisted in other arguments, this is Mary, well, she pained to be delivered. So the uh, fanciful and uh, heretical view t teachings in ancient uh among the Christians of the ancient church, but not part of that uh, Christianity, that Mary's uh, offspring kind of beamed out of her. And so she she remained a, a virgin, physically a virgin, despite Jesus' birth is just, is ludicrous. And, and contrary to what uh, scripture has to say about uh, Jesus' true humanity. Uh, although of course, since Jesus could walk through locked doors, you know, anything is possible for Jesus. I certainly would, we wouldn't deny that it would be possible, but there's nothing in scripture that teaches us that. As for the idea that uh, coming together again, it doesn't refer to sexual relations. Well, look at the context. The, the, whole, the, the context is clearly talking about sexual relations from the defraud ye not one another, except it be with consent for a time, and the that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. There, there's no doubt that that refers to sexual relations. And the idea that this is somehow based on a textual variant is remarkable. Uh, although there may indeed be a textual variant, I noticed that the new Vulgate does change the text there from the Clementine Vulgate. So they, they you know, I leave that up to you as to whether to, to accept one or the other, but the, the rest of the context remains the same in, in both Vulgates. And uh, the exact Greek word that's used isn't really the issue here. The issue here is that is the bigger picture that First Corinthians 7 is talking about husbands and wives living together as husbands and wives, and that they ought to do that on a regular basis. And that the other way, being incontinent is a problem and a it could lead them into temptation. So in short, uh, oh, about the fathers, very, very briefly. I mentioned that the fathers through the fourth century essentially don't discuss this issue. Although we do have on the one side, Tertullian, who did wander into heresy later in, in life, but he's also the father of Latin Christianity and, and one of the most notable theologians of his era uh, who, who discusses it. And we have people like Helvidius, whose works we don't have the rest of, we only have what Jerome said. And obviously we know very well what Jerome thought, but Jerome was wrong and the reason why is because of his misunderstanding about the impropriety of sexual relations. That's a significant error that led to this ascetic error led to a lot of other problems. And uh, thankfully, we, we can set that aside and affirm that Mary did indeed have other children besides Jesus. All right. 
Well, that concludes it. Uh, Y'all go ahead and call in with your questions. 1-800-484-3801. I'm going to put it in the chat. 1-800-484-3801. Here's one. Is the perpetual virginity a doctrine central to the gospel? Is it a denial of the gospel to reject it and worthy of the anathema of Galatians 1? William, I think that would be for you. Yeah, well, if we're talking about the gospel in the sense of everything that is proclaimed to be the truth, um, then it broadens it to the fact of the good news, the fact that Christ came, died for our sins on the cross, which usually when we speak of the gospel, that is what we're referring to. If we broaden it and we say central to the gospel, to the teaching of the gospels, is it um, is it a very important teaching? Is it anathema to deny it? Uh, the church has, de- has defined it already as, as being a central teaching of the faith. Why should we believe something that people think, well, you know what, um, you know, it's not a major teaching like the bodily resurrection or, or, um, or the deity of Christ. We should believe anything that is true. Anything that is taught in the Bible and taught by the early church, uh, we should believe. And the perpetual virginity of Mary is clearly taught in the Bible and clearly taught in the early fathers. So I would say that we definitely should believe because of that. Uh, Mr. Sir, do this one is for UT fan. If Jesus had other brothers and sisters, why is Mary entrusted to the Apostle John after his passing? I think that's for you. I, I suppose so, because uh, it assumes what I believe to be true. And I... I hinted at that in my opening speech, which is that before Jesus' resurrection, the evidence that we have in the New Testament is that his brothers didn't believe. John tells us that explicitly, I think in John 7, 5, he says, for neither did his brothers believe in him. In fact, they're the ones who who told him in John 7, 3, or, or I, mean, I think it was in John 7, I could be misremembering exactly, but they basically said, you know, nobody does these miracles and signs that you're doing and does and keeps them to themselves. Go and show the world. This was their, their, you know, what they they tried to goad him into doing. And then John explains the reason that they said this is so they didn't believe him. Basically, they're like, oh yeah, you can do all these amazing things. So if you can do all these amazing things like you're claiming, go and show the world. Don't don't just hide it here in Nazareth or wherever. Uh, I think it was Nazareth that they were at that point. But anyway, that that's uh, that's the reason why she would be entrusted to one of Jesus' disciples because. Uh, Jesus' disciple believed at that time. Later, the brethren believed after the resurrection. That's why we see them in Acts. Um, church and fan, if, I, if I'm able to just add some church and fan, when, whenever you, I, I don't know what is happening. I think Michael noticed too, like if you move the mic a certain way, it kind of muffles you a little bit. Oh. Yeah, it's making a noise. And I, I think you're it, moving it or maybe there's something in it. it it's making the headphones a, might be hitting it. Yeah, uh, something's definitely. Um, okay, so uh, well, we have a call here. Let me go ahead and take it. Caller, you're live with Reason and Theology. Can you hear us? Yeah, sure can. You can hear me? I can hear you. Is everybody able to hear them? Yep. Oh. All right. What, what questions do you have for us? Uh, and, and who is it for specifically? Uh, my question is for uh, Turretin fan. Mm-hmm. So, um, I was I was curious. The, the term "mother of God" is used. Uh, it began somewhere in the third century. Now, um, paralleling that, how come? May, maybe there is, but is is the term "brothers of God" ever used? And if not, don't you think that wouldn't be consistent with your position? So, specifically, in your research, has, has have you ever come across the term "brothers of God" as there is the mother of God? And so, uh, if William can also touch on that, so I'm just looking for consistency. So, uh, go ahead. Sure. Uh, the The term theotokos became a, a, a term of widespread use really more in the fourth century. I know there's some dispute about it maybe arising in the third century. Uh, I, in the original Greek, the original Greek word was the God bearer, theotokos, which uh, William and I have actually discussed before, you know, a few times. But theotokos, of course, isn't literally, it's not the word for mother, the tok, the the tokos means like a bearer of God, like the container of God, the one that's that's bearing God, referring to her bearing him in her, her womb. And really, the emphasis is on the fact that Jesus is God from God and man uh, from this earliest time. He didn't become God later or something like that. So, I, I, no, there's there's not a 
there's no other relations where I know in the Latin tradition, it became uh, sometimes mother of God. And in English, we, we will sometimes use the phrase mother of God. And if you understand it correctly, as referring to the mother of the God man, as to his humanity, then it then it's an orthodox statement. Uh, but although that's true, that Mary's parents would then be the grandparents of Jesus, and therefore you could call them the grandparents of God. But I don't recall anyone in the early church calling them the grandparents of the God, of God. I don't recall anyone saying the cousins of God or the half brothers of God or any of these other terms that are sometimes used. Some some people will claim that the what are called the brethren or uh, are just re more remote relatives, either half brothers through Joseph or cousins or some other kind of broad relation. And none of them are called the, you know, the half brother of God or the cousin of God or the, the kinsfolk of God that I can think of, except of course that all believers are called the brothers of Christ. We're, we're called the brethren with Jesus as the firstborn. So we, what the this spiritual sense of being the brother of uh, Jesus definitely swamped the the theological category and flooded that theological category to the point where referring to s these specific children as the brethren of Christ really uh, went out the window and Jesus approved of that when he t when he was told that his mother and brethren were waiting for him he looked around at the people his disciples and he said these are my mother and my brethren. So it's quite, uh, it's divinely authorized to neglect uh, reference to his physical half-brethren as such, and, and instead just to refer to uh, all believers as the, as the brethren. Looking for one uh, specifically for you, William, some of these, they're not directed to anyone in particular, so it's kind of hard to tell if y'all can write it to an individual in particular. Um, William, did you see any in there for you? Uh, I, I haven't, but I think the caller wanted me to touch upon that as well. Is the go caller ahead. still on? He's not, but go ahead. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, I agree with, uh, surprisingly, I agree with a lot of what Turton Van said. Um, uh, we'll definitely uh, disagree on the early history of when that term originated. Um, I think it was much earlier than he said. Uh, but I think, uh, Mother of God is very clearly uh, found in Luke one, where uh, where Mary is called um, uh, the mother of uh, of my Lord. That Greek word kurios there is used um, for Yahweh in all in every portion in every place where kurios appears in Luke one, uh, which is a good thing. It's talking about Christ being uh, our our divine incarnate God. Uh, in that sense, where she's called mother of our Lord, I think that's a very clear reference to her being mother of God. Uh, one point I would add is that um, uh, in many liturgies, James is called uh, the brother of God. So that that is one thing that uh, that I would add. Um, maybe it, it it isn't as as common as people uh, would be aware of, but uh, that's something I would add. There really isn't a whole lot of, uh, more to add there. I think we agree. Uh, one area where we would probably disagree on, uh, we agree that uh, it's definitely important, in, in my opinion. Uh, to protect against Christological heresies. Uh, I think we would probably agree on that. I think Church and Fan would probably argue that it is uh, devolved within Catholicism. I don't think it has. It's, I think it's always been used uh, the same way. But topic for a whole other day. Whole, whole other day. I would just thank you very much for that. I, I would tack on to what you were saying. If, if we're including more broadly the term Lord, then you do have an example in Galatians 1.19. Yeah. It says, but, of, but other of the apostles saw I none save James, the Lord's brother, which I think some of the fathers, at least, maybe not, I don't know what the, the I haven't done a, a comprehensive study, but I think some of them do interpret that as meaning James, the one that's referred to in that list in Matthew. Yeah, I would agree. I would definitely agree. So this one is for you, William, um, <clears throat> from Kyle. Uh, do you believe that the Proto-Evangelion of James is good evidence for the perpetual virginity of Mary? Should it be used as primary? primary? I think it's fantastic evidence. Uh, I think it's very, very good evidence. It's a very early uh, Christian document that is being used. We have evidence coming out um, that, uh, from modern-day scholarship dating that to a very early period. Excuse me. Uh, we have a number of clear ancient teachings being preserved in there. 
there's nothing um, that would smack of Gnosticism or any other kind of heresy that you might find in the Odes of Solomon. I think it's a very solid source. Um, I would draw uh, one distinction. I would think that uh, I think a number of fathers that hearkened to the Proto-Evangelium of James did not use it as a historical source by believing everything within it, but they recognized that certain ancient traditions were preserved within it. Caller, you're live with Reason and Theology. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, and what's your name and uh, who's your question for? Yeah, so um, my name is Brene, and my question is for a uh, certain fan, but I also uh, want to have uh, William com comment on it. Um, now, is it, it, I guess a certain fan of the opinion or the thought that um, the household of Christ was like a contemporary nuclear family, or, or would you have had uh, extended relatives in that family? Um, and I guess and that's in reference to whenever William was making that point about um, referencing Ken whenever he had just talked, when they had just referenced the brothers and the sisters. Um, and also, um, do you find any evidence of uh, the brothers and sisters of Christ being referenced, I guess, at that time uh, in Scripture whenever he's lost the temple? So those are kind of the, the, the ideas I wanted to have him touch upon. So, in terms of the question of the household, including people beyond the, the nuclear family, what I can say is that when there was the escape to Egypt that's mentioned, we're not men no other family members are mentioned. And, it, you know, that's an argument about silence, of course as so many things are, but that, that's, what, that's the scriptural evidence that we have. We don't, we don't have it described that Joseph took his, let's say, his other children, if the, it, you know, some, some people have speculated that Jesus' brothers are actually half-brothers, uh, or not half-brothers at all, but uh, only Joseph's children, and Joseph's children from some previous marriage, but the idea of being Joseph was this el elderly man at the time. Uh, so under that speculation, if that if that's the speculation, then you kind of would expect that Joseph might take these other uh, relatives with him if they're going to subsequently be, uh, you know, jetting around Judea with Jesus' mother later on in Jesus' life. So that would mean they would be, you know, young youngish children at that time. Now, supposing they were adults already, then I suppose that would just resolve that particular dilemma, right? Uh, but in, in terms of Jesus' household, again, what we have in the New Testament is a picture of Jesus as relatively poor. He doesn't have, he's like, uh, a fox, he says something about a fox having a place to, a, a den in which to sleep, but but the son of man doesn't even have that. The idea is that he, his father uh, is a carpenter, but there's no indication that he was particularly financially successful. And although he was given gold and myrrh and frankincense at his birth, there's no indication that that uh, wealth, you know, lasted and that he was wealthy growing up or that he would have had a, a large household with a lot of other extended family in the household. It was just simply not told that. And th there's no particular reason to accept that idea. Uh, I'm trying to remember some of the rest of this discussion. I guess there's the... Uh, it, am I saying that that the term house couldn't include a larger group of cousins and so forth? I actually, of course, I think that house can have a broader reference. So when I was talking about the funnel of country, kinsfolk, house, I, I don't think it necessarily, I haven't looked carefully to see the usage, but I don't think necessarily the house has to be that smallest unit because, you know, sometimes even uh, a larger unit than a single household is, is referred to as a house. Uh, and I, I'm trying to remember, do you, do you remember if there was something else in the question that I'm overlooking? I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I think you touched upon pretty much most of the points. Okay. Well, and, and your follow up then. Sure. Um, I would point out that it clearly the mention of um, Christ's comment about um, uh, was, was clearly referring to the fact that he was uh, traveling to many different locations. Christ clearly had a house in Nazareth. 
Uh, the Gospels tell us very clear about that. Uh, I think the point, uh, the question from the person is a very good one because Mark 6 and other Gospels, even Luke, are quoting from Numbers 1. You look at Numbers 1, 2 to 3, you see extended family there. You have Singen uh utilized there as well. Uh, we clearly know that Mark 6 is utilizing that, hearkening to that. We know Christ is talking about his brothers and sisters using that term, but then in a synonymous manner, calling them his, uh, a term the Liddell and Scott and others uh, uh, translate as uh, cousins. Uh, just a few, just a, a verse later, referring to them as his singing All the fathers, when they interpreted that, they were unanimous interpreting that. So I think that it is definitely an extended kind of family. That is what we see here. I think it's very obvious. I think the text is very clear about that. Um, I don't remember what else was part of the question, uh, but I'll leave it at that so we can get to other people. All right. Thank you for your call there. Um, <clears throat> there was another one here for you, William. I mean, it's not directed specifically to you, but I definitely think that um, it should be addressed. The Psalm 69, 8 show that Mary had other children? That is a great question. I would point that, I would point the person to the fact that not a single early father interpreted that psalm to be uh, Mariological. I would add that point, uh, to add a point, I'd say we have to be very careful because sure we have messianic prophecies and foreshadowing in the psalms but if we take that very psalm that is being quoted there and take it to its fullest conclusion the individual that is being talked about that has a mother is called a sinful person and we definitely wouldn't call the messiah sinful i would i would point people to the way the fathers interpreted that uh they interpreted my mother's children they interpreted that as um as israel some interpreted it as being the synagogue but none of them interpreted it as being mary Got any comments on that, Fam? I do. I do tend to agree that Psalm six it says, "I'm become a stranger to my brethren and alien to my mother's children." I would generally take that as referring to Jesus' physical brothers. I don't know, and I haven't studied enough to to be sure of what the underlying Hebrew says there. I would point out, though, that the very next verse, for the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, is explicitly in the New Testament assigned to Jesus. So I think it's fair to uh, assign the previous verse, verse 8, to Jesus as well, and to treat it as a messianic psalm. Uh, and, uh, and consequently, I do think that it does need an answer. And is the answer that um, my mother's children and my brethren there refer broadly to the Jewish people, or or should it or should it be taken in a narrow sense? I think that's the question to be answered. I would have to study a little bit more, but I think it's I think it's a good point. I, one reason I didn't argue from that is I thought that the New Testament's clear enough, uh, but but it's it's worth considering for sure. If you don't mind me adding, I, I um just to clarify, I think I I could even believe it or not, even agree with what Turchin fans said. Another aspect, even though we don't see the fathers using it. That's why I was saying, you know what, this is what I think it is. The fathers use it more. I would have no problem at all if Turretin fans said, well, uh, I believe that that would be referring uh, to Mary there. I could affirm that as well, and I believe a Catholic would as well. What we would say, though, is we'd say Revelation 12 clearly shows that Mary's other children are the believers. So in one aspect, I think that is another way of being able to look at it and answer it, even though I'm not aware of any fathers that utilize it that way. Caller, you're live with Reason and Theology. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you guys hear me? Sure can. Uh, what's your name and who's your question for? All right. Uh, my name is John, and my question is for uh, church and fan, although William can feel free to comment on it. Um, in the early church, there are three positions on uh, what uh, went on between Mary and Joseph. Uh, the first one is the position that um, they had a marriage where uh, they were both young, and of course, they produced no offspring. Uh, Joseph had no offspring, but everyone mentioned was Christ's cousin or uh, some related kin. The second one was Joseph was a widower, where he already had children. And the third one, which does have its own presence, 
is the idea that they had children after the birth of Christ. But given that two out of the three theories um, point to the um, perpetual virginity, shouldn't that give us some kind of prior instinct that um, the it would, the burden of proof is on the person who is saying that Mary is the um, it was not a perpetual virgin, uh, given that there's only one in three uh, odds there. I will let uh, William answer in terms of whether there was some early patristic tradition uh, that that's different from one another and contradicting one another. It wouldn't surprise me that there's contradictory tradition on, on issues. And I don't think that when we see contradictory tradition on issues uh, that we should think we have to pick one of those competing contradictory traditions. Uh, and in this case, I think, I, I mean, obviously I agree with what you identified as the third option, which is that Mary and, Jesus, or Mary and Joseph went on to have other children. But the reason I hold to that is not because I found it in Tertullian, or and, and Tertullian is, in, is a very early writer, or some, or because I found, or because of the condemnation of the Proto-Evangelium of James by Innocent. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, or it's not because of those reasons. It's because the New Testament says that that the angel of the Lord came to Joseph and said, "Don't be afraid to take Mary to be your wife." And we know from the rest of the New Testament what being a wife entails, and the New Testament talks about his brothers and sisters. And I think with that in mind, I think then there's a heavy, there's this uh, overwhelming mountain to climb to come up with an explanation for why are, why would somebody who has a vow of virginity, if that's what we're going to think, why would such a person get married in the first mm -hmm. place? The point of marriage is actually to have children and to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Uh, the point of uh, you know, the typical Jewish Va uh, blessings would be to, that you'd be like uh, the woman would be like Pharaoh's uh, and you could go on and on but the point is I think that the burden with the New Testament evidence is reversed and the and even the Old Testament evidence as well the Old Testament uh, the, there's a heavy presumption for women that they should be married and have children and uh, and the idea that Mary would have been planning not to break with that is uh, is odd even if Philo uh, points to some sect where people voluntarily were celibate. Um, uh, I, I think, let me clarify, did the caller want to know also whether or not there were any fathers that believed um, Joseph was young, uh, contrary to him being old? Was that part of the question, Turretin Fan? I think that was the... The first one of the three options, one was that they were both young, one was that Joseph was old, a widower, perhaps. And and they were just wondering if there were, were, were any fathers that con conflicted in the terms of that information? Uh, well, I think it was presented as the, the, as a fact. I, I didn't uh, hear the citation or anything like that, but I think okay. it was just presented as though it was a fact. I, 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 don't, I don't recall any specific father saying that first option. So I can't confirm that myself. I'm just telling you that what I heard okay. in the question. Yeah, for the person wondering, yeah, I'm aware of both traditions. Uh, the tradition that I tend to fall in line with is clearly Mary having been young. I think there's an argument that I, even though we won't get into that today, I think there's an argument that could even be made uh, for Joseph having been uh, uh, a perpetual virgin, uh, although there, that, that is an argument for a whole other day. I think fathers make both of them. So we have certain fathers that take one position. We have some that take another. Why is there a conflicting view of the identities in terms of some believe them to have been half brothers, some uh, believe them to have been cousins? I think the one thing that I think is very telling and the most important is I think they recognize as we get a little bit disconnected from uh, the gospels and then the uh, first, second century, they recognize the clear language utilized in Mark 6 of them literally, we're literally told they're the, the singing usin. So some believe that by virtue of that language, like Jerome, that they were cousins. Others believed them to have been half-brothers. And I don't think they only relied on the Proto-Evangelium, because if you clearly read Origen, and even Clement of Alexandria, I think they're very clear that they're not relying on the Proto-Evangelium. I think they're relying on the divine tradition of the church. 
and of course, I would argue uh, the Bible as well. So I do recognize that there's different strains of tradition in the early church in regards to that. The one thing that you don't find amongst any fathers, you don't find any of them, none of them, believing that Mary had any other children. Now, you know, if, if I'm going to be fair to my audience and fair and, and, um, and not be jumping off of the topic and, and you know, kind of really sticking to it, I never call Tertullian a father. I always refer to him as a church writer. I think for that very reason, the fact that he said very questionable things, he fell into heresy. And another thing I would like to add, you don't find Tertullian in the ancient diptychs. That says a lot for you right there. Uh, caller, mm -hmm. did that clarify or answer your question? Um, actually, I think I might have been misunderstood because I didn't communicate it properly. Uh, what I was actually trying to ask both of them was, um, does the person who have, who has the position that Mary was not a perpetual virgin, do they have to provide um, the burden of proof in this case because two out of the three uh, main interpretations throughout uh, Christian history and tradition uh, go to Mary being the perpetual virgin? So there's a, so if you have three main hypotheses and um, the odds are two out of three that she was a perpetual virgin, just going from the prior uh, evidence alone without looking at any of the rest of the evidence and debating it, that, that comes later. Um, who would have the burden of proof given the uh, given the odds looking beforehand? That's I think, I think anybody that would take the, the affirmative, you, you right away uh, have the burden of proof. Uh, I, I would argue that the, 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 the massive amount of evidence is on, on my side, but I think by virtue of the fact that I, I opened and I'm the one making the positive assertion, I think the burden of proof does fall on me to prove the, the point, at least as, as far as that goes. Okay. All right, thank you. That's good. Excellent. Well, thank you for your uh, question, there, caller. Um, gentlemen. I I believe that is it. Um, everybody else, I appreciate y'all asking questions. We're pretty much out of time here. We're at the two hour mark. If y'all want to put in your questions, uh, whenever this posts on YouTube, if you want to put in your questions there, um, you know, if our debaters have time, they might be able to take a look at it and uh, answer. Uh, but I don't want to speak for them, so <laughs> not speaking on their behalf here, but uh, just throwing it out there. Y'all could, um, you know, put your questions there if uh, they weren't answered. All right. So um, once again, I appreciate it. I think you're yeah, too yeah. I, I just want to make a quick pitch for the Stump the Apologist. That might be yeah. another option for callers to call in if they think of something later. Maybe Stump William or myself. Absolutely. We're going to start doing uh, Stump the Apologist more frequently once a month. Ask a Catholic once a month, at least. Um, we're going to have um, at least one lecture a month for our patrons and then a bonus episode for patrons. So check us out at patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if y'all want to, uh, you know, participate in those, if you want to uh, see them. And also, of course, if you want to support us. But gentlemen, I want to thank y'all both for this debate. It was fun. It was excellent. And I look forward to y'all doing more. Definitely. T-Fan, good to have you back on. Been a while. My pleasure. All right. William, always a pleasure. Thank you, brother. You all have a great one. And everybody, thank you for watching again. Please don't forget to comment, like, subscribe, and share this on your social media. Till next time. God bless.